This has been a rough year for fitness influencers. With the untimely passing of Larissa Borges and Joe Aesthetics shocking many people around the world. Today, as we examine both of these cases from a detailed medical perspective, I'm curious to discover if there is some through line or commonality linking them, and what, if any, preventive measures may have been taken. Before we go any further, I'd like to extend my sincerest condolences to the families and friends of Larissa and Joe. Even in the medical profession, dealing with an untimely passing isn't something that you ever get used to. All right, so let's jump into this. 33-year-old Brazilian fitness influencer Larissa Borges died on August 28th after suffering a cardiac arrest at only 33 years of age. At the time of her passing, she was in a coma recovering from another previous cardiac arrest that occurred on August 20th while she was traveling the city of Gramado, Suero Gaucha. Cardiac arrest is a critical medical emergency that occurs when the heart abruptly stops beating, usually due to disruptions in its electrical system, resulting in a loss of consciousness and, if left untreated, eventual death. Immediate intervention is crucial, involving cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, and defibrillation to restore normal heart rhythm. The three primary causes of cardiac arrest are ventricular fibrillation, or VF, ventricular tachycardia, VT, and myocardial infarction, heart attack. Technically, both VF and VT are arrhythmias, characterized by irregular heartbeats stemming from issues within the heart's internal electrical system. Let me explain. The heart actually possesses its own electrical system, regulating the timing and sequence of heartbeats. This system generates electrical impulses that travel through the heart muscle, orchestrating coordinated contractions. When malfunctions occur in this internal electrical system, VF results in a chaotic heartbeat, while VT leads to a dangerously fast rhythm, both of which can cause the heart to cease beating altogether. Myocardial infarction, commonly known as a heart attack, is a distinct yet related condition that occurs due to blocked coronary arteries. The coronary arteries supply vital oxygen-rich blood to the heart muscle. When these arteries become blocked, the heart muscle doesn't receive sufficient blood, leading to tissue damage or death. It's important to note that while a heart attack is separate from a cardiac arrest, it can sometimes trigger dangerous arrhythmias, such as ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, which if left untreated may lead to cardiac arrest. But in the case of Larissa Borges, the presence of any of these injuries is strange, since they are generally more common among older individuals due to age-related factors, such as underlying heart disease, atherosclerosis, changes in the heart's electrical system, and the increased likelihood of taking multiple medications. Yes, a young person experiencing cardiac arrest may have an inherited arrhythmia syndrome or congenital heart conditions, but typically the cause is something along the lines of asphyxia due to suffocation or choking, drug overdose, or electrolyte imbalance. We'll circle back to this momentarily. This article published in Regional News may be able to shed some light on the situation. There is a report of possible ingestion of narcotic substances combined with alcoholic beverages. The body was sent for autopsy. We will try to search through laboratory tests for substances that she possibly consumed. We have already heard from the boyfriend who was with her and we are investigating the case. I was unable to find any more definitive information as to the presence of illicit drugs in combination with alcohol, but the possibility is unnerving. Even more so when we consider that a common cause of electrolyte imbalances in young people is a combination of poor dietary choices and excessive physical activity, particularly in the context of sports or intense exercise. Since her passing, Larissa's Instagram page has been closed, but from the posts that remain on other accounts, it's clear she valued her time in the gym her physique, and as well as the lavish lifestyle associated with being an influencer. Consider this scenario. An extremely strenuous workout or cardio session during the day reduces electrolytes. Then, in the evening, an illicit substance raises heart rate and possibly exacerbates electrolyte imbalances even further. Now, I know full well, I'm not getting through this video without addressing the big sick elephant in the room. Have a look at this comment posted under the New York Post article about Larissa. The first commenter says, just seems like drugs are more dangerous than they were back in my day. And there is some truth to that statement. Fentanyl, xylazine, and other modern opioid cocktails, for example, are quite potent and dangerous when in the presence of alcohol. But cocaine, amphetamine class drugs, and ecstasy, known to raise heart rate, could easily have a hand in a cardiac arrest-based death. And those have been around for quite a while now. I used to carry a gram of cocaine in my boot 
at all times. The final commenter YP is quick to fire back. Another dummy who can't realize it's from the vax says unknown causes. Fitness influencers not gonna die from drinking, etc., but they will die from the mRNA vax. Another clown. <laughs> There's a whole lot to unpack in this comment. First of all, I could not find conclusive evidence that Larissa was fully vaccinated, nor was the vaccine mandatory in Brazil. But for the sake of learning, let's suppose that she took it. I've said this before and I will say it again. We now know the vaccine to be related to arrhythmias. In fact, an article published in 2023 in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences by Dr. Nino Coco et al. explains, we found that heart rhythm disorders after COVID vaccination are not uncommon and deserve more clinical and scientific attention. The percentage is relatively small, but obviously not negligible as arrhythmias are related to cardiac arrests. But, and this is really important. We also know contracting COVID, the actual virus, not the vaccine, is related to arrhythmias. Dr. Aidin Husanoff et al. reported in February 2023 publication of Viruses Journal that in a significant proportion of patients, ranging from about 10 to 50%, with former COVID-19 cardiopulmonary symptoms such as dyspnea or shortness of breath, palpitations, restricted physical activity, and cardiac arrhythmias can persist weeks and months after the acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. All right, explain this to me like I'm a two-year-old, okay? Because there's an element to this thing I just cannot get through my thick head. This means that unless you plan on avoiding COVID altogether, slightly elevated risk of arrhythmias are a distinct scientific possibility. The vaccine represents a calculated risk, and I'm not here to defend it. I just want you to understand that sweeping statements like the one made by YP are not helpful. Because typically, in the case of a young, apparently healthy individual like Larissa or Bronnie James, whose cardiac arrest I also covered, there are likely several factors at play. And it wouldn't be very scientific to boil it down to one factor without considering the full breadth of possibilities. Before we move on, I need to challenge something else YP said that I know full well many people are thinking. The appearance of health or physical tropes that we associate with health are not good indicators that a person is healthy on the inside. Let me say it again for the people in the back. Conventionally attractive or desirable physique, low body fat percentage, shapely figure, approachable smile, and skin do not indicate that a person is healthy. The statement, fitness influencers are not gonna die from drinking, can't really be made. It suggests that whatever happened to Larissa that precipitated her first cardiac arrest was A, inconsequential as a night of drinking, and B, assumes that her health was robust enough to withstand whatever might have happened that day. But these assessments are made solely on her apparent health. A front-facing appearance-based and very deceptive conception of health. We might substitute electrolyte imbalance or illicit stimulant usage for the word drinking, and suddenly a life might indeed be in danger. She may have taken the vaccine or decided not to, but contracted COVID due to a lifestyle that obviously involves travel, with both options increasing the likelihood of an arrhythmia. As uncomfortable as it may be to do, we might also call into question the actual health of fitness influencers, and yes, even Larissa. Due to the pressures associated with looking your best as often as possible, a fitness influencer might be under immense unapparent stress. Stress associated with maintaining low body fat, maintaining impressive muscle shape and tone, portraying an enviable lifestyle, etc., etc. In order to stand out, look great, attract brands and clients, and you know, make a living, influencers often push themselves to the limit and supplement with all sorts of stimulants, PEDs, and even surgical enhancements to expand their natural appearance and abilities. This is the kind of body that people would want to show off at the gym if it were made of real muscle. I haven't been in the gym in like 12 years. It should be noted that performance enhancing drugs are used for more than just bigger muscles, as some may think. Dr. Annika Bjornsson et al. wrote in 2016 article published in Substance Abuse Treatment Prevention and Policy, in general, women appear to prefer doping class agents other than AAS or anabolic steroids, particularly those associated with weight loss, such as ephedrine and clenbuterol. I am in no means pointing my finger here, but as a quick example, let's consider one of the substances Dr. Bjornsson et al. mentioned. Clenbuterol is technically labeled a stimulant and essentially raises the body's temperature and turns your body into a calorie burning machine. I was supposed to take this for a month, but I had to stop after two weeks. 
because I lost too much weight. So yeah, you may lose weight, but since Clen stimulates the beta-2 adrenergic receptors, which are also found in the heart, it is known to increase heart rate as part of its stimulant effect, which we also know to be related to cardiac arrest. I thought I'd lean up a little bit. I didn't want to end up like this guy. We can't ignore this type of possible correlation, just as we can't ignore the effects of COVID and the mRNA vaccine. As always, I'm trying to encourage a well-rounded research-based analysis in any situation that concerns the loss of human life. Take one trip through Fitness Influencer Instagram, and you'll know that it is a highly competitive area. And sometimes that competitive environment drives people to do things that aren't exactly healthy in order to fulfill a societal and unfortunately unrealistic conception of health. Not to mention, the cumulative effects of living under this pressure for an extended period of time, as you can see, there are many variables, and we've only touched the tip of the iceberg. Earlier this year, we lost Joe, Joe Aesthetics Lindner, to an aneurysm at only 30 years of age. An aneurysm is a medical condition that involves the abnormal enlargement or ballooning of a blood vessel, typically an artery, due to a weakened or damaged wall. This can occur in various parts of the body, but it is most concerning what it happens happens in the brain or a major artery. Depending on where an aneurysm occurs, the symptoms with which it presents may be different. Joe's partner Nika, or at I'm a Peaches, who posted an emotional message on Instagram following his passing, might give us some clues as to where his was. Three days ago, kept saying that he had pain in his neck. We didn't realize until it was too late. Since the pain was in his neck, there are a couple of possibilities, namely the vertebral and carotid arteries, or a cerebral aneurysm which occurs in the brain. Cerebral, or intracranial aneurysms in the brain, can lead to symptoms like severe headaches, visual disturbances, and neurologic deficits as they depress brain tissues. Neck pain is not primarily a characteristic symptom of cerebral aneurysms. However, it could be related to secondary effects of intracranial aneurysms, such as changes in posture or muscle tension due to headaches or discomfort. It's painful. But it looks pretty cool, right? But Nika, Joe's partner, never mentioned a headache. A growing aneurysm in either the carotid or vertebral arteries could cause neck pain as it pushes on the muscles, nerves, and other structures located nearby. Between the two types, aneurysms to the carotid artery are more common, though neither are particularly common. An article written for the Journal of Vascular Surgery by Karen Garge et al. tells us aneurysms of the extracranial carotid artery, or ECCA, are rare, with a reported incidence of 0.2 to 5% of all carotid artery surgeries. Unfortunately, if this is indeed what he suffered from, Joe was part of an unlucky minority. That being said, in his case, some other important risk factors were present, which I'll get to momentarily once we all understand how a fatal aneurysm actually affects someone. The process begins with a weakened section of an artery, which begins to bulge or dilate as the weakened wall cannot effectively withstand the pressure of the blood flow, and blood accumulates within the tissue. You may be surprised to learn that if the story had ended there, Joe might still be alive. In fact, many people have aneurysms like the one I've just described. A bulge may be present, but remain asymptomatic if the tissue never bursts or ruptures. As a result, a significant proportion of aneurysms are discovered incidentally during medical examinations or imaging tests for unrelated issues. Not exactly the type of surprise you look forward to. Eventually, as pressure accumulates, the weakened tissue bursts, causing rapid and uncontrolled internal bleeding, resulting in inadequate cerebral perfusion or blood flow, potential hemorrhagic shock, and ultimately, without medical intervention, organ failure and death. You see, when a large amount of blood is lost from the circulatory system, there is a sudden drop in blood pressure, depriving vital organs of the oxygen and nutrients they need to function. When you combine this with disrupted blood flow to your central computer, <laughs> bad things happen. Even if a carotid aneurysm doesn't burst, blood clots can sometimes form in the aneurysm and block blood flow to your brain. I mean, any blockage involving the main oxygen highway to the brain is not a good thing. Now, 
As you might expect, there are several complicating factors that may have contributed to Joe's untimely passing, all of which Joe actually addressed directly in his interview on Bradley Martin's podcast, Raw, albeit in a different context. Those being PEDs, the vaccine, and an unfortunate array of post-vaccine complications, as well as a rare pre-existing health condition called rippling muscle syndrome. We'll consider each one in detail. To be honest, I did all kinds of crazy sh let's say, in the past and stuff. Yeah. I've tried different dosages. I try to be transparent as much as I can. Yeah. Having experimented heavily in the past, Joe is no stranger to anabolic steroids, though he goes on to say, The minimum effective dose I always believe is the best. Well, if you're going to play with fire, moderation is definitely advisable because some of his past PED habits trend in the uh-oh direction. The craziest cycle that I probably did was that stupid coach back in the days also who put me on 100 milligrams of prop and 100 milligrams of trend every day. Bradley's response is telling. Damn. That was a sick cycle, right? Yeah, I got <laughs> Thankfully, Joe's supplementation practice has become more conservative over the years. For example, you have people that just start to work out and then they take like two cc's of test a week while you can take maybe 0.5 and it gives you the same effects. And while I'm glad to learn that his approach has matured, it is no secret that the negative effects of anabolic steroids affect the body in a cumulative manner, meaning they compound over time. Keep in mind, Joe said back in the day, but is only 30 years old, which suggests prolonged exposure. It is also no secret that the circulatory system is at an elevated risk in long-term steroid users. A case study written by Ahai Hadari et al. and published in the Oman Medical Journal in 2020 reminds us, in many studies, atherosclerosis as a side effect of long-term anabolic adrenergic steroid consumption has been reported. AAS elevates low density lipoprotein and reduces high density lipoprotein, causing increased chances of atherosclerotic sediment and aortic wall prone to dissection. In Joe's case, this is very important. He has been using steroids for a long time, has abused them in the past, and we know them to cause atherosclerosis or thickening or hardening of the arteries caused by a buildup of plaque in the inner lining of the artery. This is a very direct correlation here in that atherosclerosis can weaken and damage carotid artery walls making them more susceptible to aneurysm formation and dilatation. This degradation can also trigger inflammation in the arterial walls to the same end. And I'll say it again, this gets worse over time. Before steroids, you know, and then um, after. They definitely make a major difference. Now, who wants to guess the next risk factor I intend to talk about? Uh, I'll give you a hint. It starts with a V. Did you get the vax? I, I got the vaccine. Did you really? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Even four. Really? Yeah. Why? Earlier on, in regards to Larissa Borges, we mentioned arrhythmia following the vaccine, but there are other adverse effects as well. A systematic review conducted by Dr. Mohammed Paknahad et al. and published in Heart and Lung in June 2023 can tell us what those are. Myocarditis, with an overall rate around 1.62%, was shown to be the most common post-COVID-19 immunization cardiac event, reported more commonly in men and following the second dose of the immunization. So myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart tissue, specifically the myocardium or middle layer of the heart wall that can affect your heart's electrical system and muscle cells, leading to irregular heart rhythms and problems with your heart's pumping function. It should be noted that myocarditis and carotid aneurysms are not directly related conditions. They affect different parts of the circulatory system and have distinct causes and consequences. But the article goes on to list several other less common complications observed post-vaccination, including A, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, a condition characterized by sudden dysfunction of the left ventricle of the heart, B, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, where blood clots form in small vessels throughout your body that can limit or block the flow of blood to your organs, and C, a pulmonary embolism, a sudden blockage in your pulmonary arteries, the blood vessels that send blood to your lungs. Can you guess which one may be of interest to us here? If you guessed B, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VITT, you're correct. In severe cases, the widespread formation of these small blood clots, or microclots throughout the body, could potentially affect blood vessels supplying the brain, damaging the vascular walls and increasing the risk of vascular abnormalities, such as 
aneurysm. However, this is a stretch and far less direct of a correlation than the earlier one we drew between atherosclerosis and carotid aneurysm. At best, VITT could be considered a comorbidity alongside the atherosclerosis, provided doctors found them to be present. Now, I will be the first to tell you that there have been also scattered case reports of aneurysm in patients following the administration of the vaccine. However, these are few and far between. Furthermore, most cases of this nature share similarities that we cannot ignore. As such, I have included links to several of these reports from various journals below, and I will summarize some of their findings. First, Dr. Kivan Yang et al. identified a left middle cerebral artery bifurcation aneurysm in a 56-year-old female patient who had experienced intracranial hemorrhage after receiving her first dose of tozinamarin. This occurred suddenly after the injection, which is out of the ordinary since in other reported cases, it only occurs several days later. Up next, Sotaro Ashida et al. studied the effects of the vaccine in a rural district in Japan and found three incidences of intracranial aneurysm, where all three cases developed subarachnoid hemorrhage within three days, range zero to three days, of the first or second dose of the BNT mRNA COVID-19 vaccine by Pfizer-BioNTech. Lastly, Dr. Kohei Chida et al. reported a six-year-old woman who developed a subarachnoid hemorrhaging due to vertebral artery aneurysm one day following the vax, as well as a 72-year-old woman who suffered a vertebral artery dissecting aneurysm seven days after the vaccine. Can you see a trend beginning to form? The youngest person thus far was 44 years old, and all cases occurred within days after receiving the first or second dose. Nor were any of the affected arteries the carotid arteries, though admittedly, I am only speculating that this is where Joe's aneurysm occurred. Either way, these findings would suggest that Joe dodged the post-vaccine aneurysm bullet and his injury was associated with other factors. Would you believe me if I told you the plot gets thicker? I went to the doctor and I did my blood work again because I take my blood work all the time and then I show it to the doctor and we kind of see these particles and I'm like, what is this? For context, Joe had his blood work evaluated after taking the vaccine where apparently they found vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, which we discussed earlier as a documented response to the vaccine in some cases. Joe's VITT was so severe in fact the doctor urged him towards emergency treatment. And, and yeah, and this, this guy's also big into it. So he's like, you need to do a plasmapheresis now. Plasmapheresis is a medical procedure that involves removing a person's blood, separating the liquid part of the blood called the plasma, and then returning the blood cells to the person along with replacement fluid called plasma substitute or a replacement solution. This process helps to remove harmful substances from the bloodstream, such as toxins, autoantibodies, or other problematic components. It's often used in critical situations like autoimmune diseases or certain poisonings to rapidly improve a person's condition by cleansing their blood. Plasmapheresis can be a life-saving treatment in specific medical emergencies. They poke like a needle into your arm here, like a pen, you know, like thick like this, right? And they take all your blood out, put it into this machine, and then clean it and bring it back. In order to transfer such a large volume of liquid, plasmapheresis does indeed make use of a needle that is larger <laughs> than a standard IV or intravenous needle. I Removal. did it, yeah, twice. I did it in six months period, like one time and then the second time. Also expensive as fuck, man. Like, yeah, it's no fun, man. A full course of treatment may involve multiple sessions, which could add up to several thousand dollars or more. Supposedly cleaned my blood. I did a D-dimer test, like this determines like the clotting of your arteries, blood yeah. arteries and stuff. To be clear, a D-dimer test is a blood test that checks for blood clotting problems by measuring the amount of D-dimer, a protein your body makes to break down blood clots. And after two treatments of plasmapheresis in a six month span, Joe came back apparently clean. But hold on, why two treatments? Dr. Sukrita Bhattacharji et al. wrote in a systematic review published in Springer Nature Comprehensive Medicine, the problem with the treatment of TTP is that although 80% of patients have a complete response to therapy, responders, about 20% of patients relapse after successful treatment of an acute episode or are refractory to plasma exchange with persistent thrombocytopenia and high levels of LDH after a complete cycle of treatment. 
at least seven days. It should be noted that contracting the actual COVID-19 virus puts one at risk for, you guessed it, TTP, as suggested extensively in the literature. Furthermore, here's an article from before COVID times that shows, Influenza A infection triggers thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura by producing the anti-Adams TS13 IgG inhibitor. You heard it right. This phenomenon is not even new to COVID. Here again, as we discussed earlier in regards to Larissa, avoiding the vaccine will not help a person avoid this ailment. Then Joe goes on to say, Yeah, I was so shocked and the doctor was like, you need to do it, man, if you want to like survive after you took these shots, bro. No way. You need to do this. However, I don't know if the nurse did something weird. This in Thailand, obviously. Yeah. So when she then took out the blood, there was some like a white thing in there. I reviewed this interview segment with Bradley Martin several times to get as clear as possible on the order of events here. What I can tell you is that at some point, a nurse incorrectly identified something that appeared to be a white blood clot in Joe's blood. So they're like, this is what you maybe have. We go to this other doctor and then I make further testing and he's like, it was not white anymore. There was no white thing. It was probably air just like the nurse didn't do it right. When he went to get a second opinion, he found out the first nurse made a mistake. Misidentifying TTP is not a small matter and we sure as heck can't blame the vaccine for causing something that Joe acknowledges never actually existed. There's these black particles. This is the heavy metal that you have in your blood. <laughs> Dude, that whole thing just trips me out. Yeah, that was such a crazy time, man. It is hard to make sense of this timeline and you may want to refer to Bradley's interview to formulate your own order of events. But to my eyes and ears, the situations he described leave us with two distinct possibilities. He received treatment for TTP based on an error that the nurse made, never actually having the clotting, before going to another doctor where he was treated for heavy metals. He received plasmapheresis from the second doctor for excess heavy medical particles in his blood, and that doctor led him to believe that those were present as a result of the vaccine. Neither option is a good look for the medical teams involved. Option one is either an error or someone taking advantage charging Joe for a procedure he does not need. Unfortunately, over the course of the interview, Joe unknowingly suggests that he is prone to conspiracy theories and peer pressure. You know how it is. This is the same like you go to a party. You were worried about your heart? And you are with the wrong people. All of a sudden, you might do something on this party that you don't want to do. I'll be honest. I was unsure if this was something I would even touch on, given that Joe has since passed away. It's just that this type of social pressure seems to play a very big role in matters of public health and safety. Did you get the vax? Why? Adds to the fear surrounding an issue and obscures the facts. We don't need to say where it is exactly, but I was there and my friends said like, we can get it, you should get it, man. And I'm like- You, you got peer just... pressure into the vax? Yeah, kind is of. Is that what you're saying? Creating a dichotomy among the population. As Joe explains elsewhere in the interview, he was also surrounded by people on the other side of the fence. And then I show it to another of my friends and there's all kind of hidden websites that you can't get to, but it's like the dark oh media kind God. of web. And there's even more conspiracies. Is... For context, he took his blood test, the one showing what we must conclude to be the dangerous heavy metal concentration and not TTP, to a friend who frequents the dark web, where apparently many hidden websites warn people about this exact problem. Turns out both his conspiratorial friend and the doctor were in agreement. Oh yeah, I was so shocked and the doctor was like, you need to do it, man, if you want to like survive after you took these shots, bro. No way. You need to do this. Sounds questionable to me, but for the sake of learning, I will seriously consider this information. Plasmapheresis for vaccine-induced heavy metal toxicity, as with everything else we've covered this far, this statement has a lot to unpack. Plasmapheresis is a possible treatment for dangerous levels of heavy metal in the blood. The claim that life-threatening amounts of heavy metals were present in the vaccine and subsequently Joe's bloodstream is less founded. Let's consider the research. In August 2021, an article written by Ali Barami et al. was published in Biological Trace Elements Research Journal, wherein they investigated the effects of heavy metals and heavy medical nanoparticles on SARS-CoV and their roles in COVID-19 pathogenesis, including a whole array of compounds such as silver MPS, gold MPS, silver gold hybrid MPS, copper nanoparticles, zinc oxide, vanadium, gallium, bismuth, titanium, palladium, silver grafted graphene oxide, and some quantum dots. Let's make this clear. 
Just because heavy metals for widespread use exist in the research phase does not mean they ever made it to live application in the general populace. That's metal in your lungs. The idea that the vaccine contains radioactive metals has been explored extensively on factcheck.org. And although that website does not carry the weight of a scientific publication, its writers thoroughly cite their work, allowing any concerned citizen to conduct their own research and to draw their own conclusions. Some of the available vaccines were shown to have aluminum adjuvants, China's Coronavac and Sinopharm, for example, which is an ingredient that helps create a stronger immune response in people receiving the vaccine. This is present in other vaccines administered for other maladies and as the CDC reminds us, has been safely used in vaccines for decades. But I'll tell you a secret. If you live in Canada or the United States, this wasn't present in the vaccine you received. If you care to look, the ingredients involved in each of these solutions is actually available to the public. Consider Pfizer. Hmm, no heavy metals there, but wait. Let's play devil's advocate and hypothesize for a moment that despite the available information, heavy metals are present in the jab. We have a simple space problem, really. You see, the size of primary doses is usually around 0.5 mils, while the booster may be smaller, measuring somewhere around 0.25 mils. This measurement includes the vaccine, as well as the solution of salt and water that it is present in, meaning the vaccine is water soluble. In order to dissolve dangerous amounts of heavy metals into some water, you would need a larger amount of water than a freaking cc or 0.5 mils. Any amount of heavy metal in the vaccine, if there even were any present, would likely be inconsequential once inside the body and filtered by the kidneys, which filter out compounds that have been dissolved in water and unlikely to remain in the blood plasma. I'm suggesting that a dangerous accumulation of heavy metal in the bloodstream would be more conceivable via more frequent exposure, like contaminated drinking water or a larger dose of a contaminated substance. In um, March, I did another show, yeah. tried to get the pro card and I used a bit of trend did also not mention this before. There is evidence that Joe upped his steroid dosage in March in preparation for a show, meaning more frequent exposure to several drugs. So I did 250 tests, I did uh, 75 trend, and then I did 100 primo also. I'm not saying those doses are high by modern bodybuilding gear usage standards, but I am suggesting they are taken more frequently and in higher amounts than the vaccine, thus providing more opportunity for the transmission of a contaminated substance. We also know that historically steroids obtained in markets without extensive regulation, as is the case in Thailand where Joe was living and obtaining his supplements, are often contaminated or or mislabeled. In a 2009 interview with Reuters, Dr. D. Zach Smith of Boston Medical Center shared the results of an extensive study on the chemical makeup of illegally obtained anabolic steroids. In Thailand, common steroids like testosterone and insulin are synthesized by private companies under lax regulation and then sold over the counter at local pharmacies. More powerful compounds such as Tren are widely available by other less reputable means as well. Tourists or newcomers to Thailand may go to the big chain mall pharmacies if they have a concern about counterfeit drugs. If even one compound in Joe's daily stack was contaminated with heavy metals, he might be in danger. Though uncomfortable to talk about, this type of eventuality must be considered alongside any proposition of vaccine contamination. Which brings us to the final point in today's lesson. They call it rippling muscle disease though as far as okay. I know. Yeah. yeah. But technically it's a cramp. It's a cramp. So what the heck is going on here? You let the fibers, let's say, shorten, let's say, right? And you squeeze it and then you stretch it out and it cannot extend as quickly. Yeah. So it starts to ripple in this way. Yeah. I'm bringing this up because of something else Joe said during his interview. Uh, the heart is also a muscle. Yeah. And that's oh, my biggest concern that's always. Scary. It's like, what if I have such a bad cramp that my heart gets a cramp? Turns out he was concerned about his heart health because of a health condition called rippling muscle disease or RMD. And given the heart is the center of the cardiovascular system, wherein the aneurysm occurred, 
I figured we should talk about it to round out our research. Now, this is a rare genetic muscle disorder that primarily affects skeletal muscles, leading to a characteristic muscle rippling or contractions when the affected muscles are tapped or stimulated. This is caused by mutations in the CAV3 gene, which encodes a protein called caveolin 3. The heart is also a muscle. Correct. But the heart is not skeletal muscle, which is a very important distinction. Skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle differ significantly in their location, function, and structure. Skeletal muscles are attached to bones, facilitate voluntary contractions, are consciously controlled, can fatigue, and rely on stored glycogen and fat for energy. In contrast, cardiac muscle is exclusive to the heart, maintains involuntary rhythmic contractions necessary for blood circulation throughout one's lifetime. Cardiac muscles are interconnected, fatigue resistant, rely on aerobic metabolism, and have limited regenerative capacity. With so many distinctions, it cannot be assumed that a disease affecting one will affect the other. Herein, the muscle label is a very broad umbrella. If you take anything away from today's video, let it reinforce the importance of critical reflection and research. Large decisions about health should only be made once all options have been thoroughly explored and investigated. Unfortunately, misinformation, fear, and confusion can sometimes obscure more prominent behavioral concerns hiding in plain sight. Over the course of my research, I came across several examples where Joe or his partner Nika talked about pushing through. So I knew I need to make content and keep pushing. So what I need to do, okay, go gym, look crazy, take videos, upload this, and then support your community. Admirable. As we may consider this approach, I'm getting go-getter type A personality vibes from Joe. Type A personalities characterized by competitiveness and stress-prone traits may increase the risk of hypertension or high blood pressure. High blood pressure, hypertension, is a risk factor for certain aneurysms as it weakens blood vessel walls. In this video, as with any other, I hope to illustrate that one's health, or lack thereof, is a very complex interplay between lifestyle choices, genetic pressures, social and societal influences. I'm taking the insulin, then I go to the gym, bruh. Too much in between, I forget to drink, carbs drop too low, blood sugar, boom, <laughs> not feeling any good. Then I have to drink a lot of sugar in order to get rid of the hypoglycemic. And so for me personally, I was like, hey, this is too dangerous. No sweeping statement can be made without first assessing the complexities at play here. And as you dive deeper, you'll understand that perhaps there is no hard and fast rule to any health-related decision. It's just really dangerous, man. As much as many of us might prefer a clear-cut, this is good, that is bad, life does not afford us such a simplified dichotomy. If I might suggest one thing in order to improve your overall health, that would be to improve your tolerance for complexity, so that when you are presented with a complicated health-related scenario, you can see through the bullshit and find a path that will truly help you to improve your overall health. Second to that, please take the notion that big muscles, toned abs, and a shredded physique are synonymous with health and longevity and throw them in the freaking trash. Joe and many other fitness influencers are doing what they can to make you pay attention, not necessarily make you or even themselves healthier. You need to be aware of the order of priorities here. Okay, with all of that off my chest, I am sincerely sorry that Joe Aesthetics was taken from this world so soon, and I am sending my love to his family and friends. Remember to join me at Human 2.0, my online gym right here on YouTube for free, where we help you to move better and prevent injury. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe to the channel and give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.